Amen. First Samuel chapter 7 as we continue our series through this book. And there's some neat things happening here. If you remember, they had the ark. They trusted in the ark, not in the Lord. When they went to battle against the Philistines, they lost the ark. The Philistines took it. Then they were cursed. They sent it from city to city. Finally, it came to this resting place. Now, the people lamented. It said that in the previous chapter. We're also going to see that here in this chapter. I want to give you a thought, an overview for this chapter. What we're going to see tonight is a recipe for revival. We're going to see a formula to get closer to the Lord. Uh, and really, it's about cleaning house. We have spring cleaning, don't we? You know, uh, it turns out if you don't clean your house for spring, if you don't take you know, some of the dust and the dirt and the old stuff out, it's eventually going to cause a lot of problems. It can cause health problems and everything else. So a good spring cleaning is a good thing. And let's consider that as we look spiritually at what the Lord is doing here as He begins to clean house in Israel so that He again can get the glory so that His presence can be there uh, through the ark. Now look at 1 Samuel verse, chapter 7, verse number 1. And the men of Kirjath-Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord, and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill, and sanctified Eleazar, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. Now remember, sanctified means set apart for a holy purpose, for a holy reason. So he sanctified his son. He set his son apart to do holy things. I have to remind you as Christians, we have a holy purpose. We should set our children apart, apart from the world for holy service that we can serve Him with our whole life and we can serve God. Why? So that we can keep the presence of God active in our life. We can keep the presence of God through keeping His Word and, and blessing our family and blessing our churches and things like that. Look at verse 2. He says, And it came to pass, while the ark abode in Kirjath-Jerim, that the time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So two generations pass here, and they're lamenting, they're mourning, they're praying, they're crying out, they're feeling bad, they're regretting, you could say they're repenting, that usually comes after lamenting. Their desire is that the Lord would bless them again and dwell with them, and they realize that some things had to be in order before God could really use them. And this is typically the way that God use, uses us. Now, in our life, we go through a roller coaster of life. There's ups and downs, um, and things are great, and then things are a problem, it seems, and we grow through that problem, and we're ready for another one. But also, our spirit Spiritual growth is the same way. Perhaps we're doing really good for the Lord and we're on fire and then we kind of get lukewarm and then we end up cold and we're not doing what we ought to do. And we begin to have some issues and some problems where the Lord really does need us to clean out our house and change our habits and change our ways if we want His blessing on our life. We have to be willing to sacrifice some things. Literally open the door like, okay, Lord, what's in my life? What's in my house that I need to get rid of? What's in my mind? What's in my heart that would please you that if I did it, I know you could use me more and you would bless me more? Look at verse 3. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth, from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve Him only, and He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. This is His way. This is the pattern. I want to focus on this verse. Uh, the first thing that He says here, in verse 3, He says, uh, Samuel spake. I want you to notice this. Samuel spake. God often works through the preaching of the Word. That's how He worked here way back then in this nation, prior to them ever having a king, and he uses preaching today. That's the same method that God uses. And Samuel spake unto the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts. Now, return. Uh, this is what we need to do. We need to listen to the preaching. And what happens is we get distracted. 
We pay attention to what everybody else is doing in the world instead of listening to what God has for us. Our minds are stolen. We're so distracted we can't even uh, pay attention to what's in front of us because there's something going on somewhere else that somebody told us about. We saw it on our phone. We saw it on the TV. We heard it on the news. Did you hear what's going to happen to the stock market? Do you know what the dollar's going to do? Do you know about that war over there? Who cares? Did you see what that person's doing? Did you see what they can do? Did you see how great they look and how big they have or what they've got going? Who cares? Now listen, if we want God's blessing on our life, first we have to listen to the speaking that God uses through preaching. His word is here for us to help us to grow. Most people won't listen to it. This nation was in trouble and they knew it and they knew that listening to the preaching was part of it. He says that we need to return with all of our heart. He says, if you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, with all your heart, what's he saying? Man, change your priorities. Make Him your goal. Get excited about what God has for you. I tell you, when you're studying out a doctrine, there's nothing more exciting than doing a verse search and finding other verses that corroborate the doctrine that you're studying. I get fired up for it. There's certain things I'm thinking about throughout the day, and it's like, oh, wait, I know of another verse that goes on that list. Or you begin looking at other verses that are similar, dealing with similar topics, and you, you see how uh, line upon line, precept upon precept, there's nothing more exciting than understanding doctrines, things you find out of the Bible. And the world says, that's boring, that's old school, nobody needs that. You know, and that's why we have a video flashing so fast that we just can't even pay attention to what we're even looking at. They still have to put words there so that we know what we're seeing and what we're hearing. I want to encourage you, if you want God's blessing on your life, you need to return to making Him a priority. Amen. Return with all of your heart. Make Him the goal. Get back to growing. Making sure that spiritual growth is a priority in your life. The next thing he says, then put away your cell phone. I'm sorry, that's not what it says. It says, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you. Put away. The next thing, so first we listen to the preaching, then we begin to return to God, then he says, put away. Put away. We've allowed idols into our life. This is a struggle just as much now as it was then. It's just different. The devil has new methods, wilds, and um, uh, activities that uh, uh, distract us. And if we're going to clean house for God, which is the thought here, then we need to put away anything that would keep us from focusing on His Word. Uh, clean out the idols out of your life. And I mean, TV and cell phone are kind of the biggest two. I really believe social media is an addictive I mean, they've already proven this 30 years ago, that video is addictive. It is physically addictive to watch video. The frame rate that video is broadcast in is it's slower than what you can see in real life. They say the human eye can perceive about 30 frames per second. Most video is coming to you in about 24 point 976 frames per second, just under 25. Why, why are they reducing it? Or 23.97, it's like, why are they reducing it? They're, it's like a slow moving uh, frame rate. It, it, it literally hypnotizes you. Everything has a frequency. We know that there's power of death and life in the tongue. And if everything has a frequency, they figured out that with video, if they slow it down just enough, it actually splits your consciousness. It takes you away from an alpha state where you're in charge and you can make decisions. And it mixes in between with a delta state where you just kind of unbiasedly relax and take all the incoming information as if it were true. You're no longer questioning the information if this is legitimate and, and accurate and righteous. You just kind of sit back and you're like, uh, you're like in a zombie state. Literally a zombie state. That's why people walk around with their phones and they bump into things and trip into things and they do whatever it shows them to do and that's their prophet and their priest and their judge and whatever it tells them is okay. They want to do that. It literally is physically addictive and if we're going to be spiritual people as we're called by God's name, then we need to fight the urge, the temptation to watch TV and to look at your cell phone and put that thing away and get in the Word of God. Put away the strange gods. Put away Ashtaroth. But it doesn't just stop there. There's friendships and family 
and co-workers. You know, there are certain people that are in your life that they believe the lie. How many people with the whole, the whole 2020 thing? It's like, oh, but don't you know this is happening? It's like, who told you that? Well, the evening news, and then I saw it on the morning news, and I saw it on my Facebook feed, and I went to work with somebody that knows somebody that something happened, and I believe the lie, right? Well, there are certain people that are influences in your life that you better get away from. You better stop listening to what you're, they're telling you because they don't have their heart in the Word of God. They have no desire to serve God, and, and their mind is somewhere else, and they're they want to drag you along. When he says, as to put away. We need to consider there are friendships we have and maybe even it's extended family that we just need to clean house and say, you know what, this person is not spiritually good for me. I'm better off not associating with them and letting them poison my heart. Look what he says next. He says, put away the strange gods, Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord. Prepare your hearts. Here's the thing. Uh, we have to replace that emptiness, that void. And he knows what he's doing. He's saying, erase the error and write in something new. Take the idol off the shelf and throw it away. And why don't you put something righteous in its stead? He tells you first to clean the slate, put it away, then to begin to prepare your heart for the Lord. Then to begin to fill yourself up as a vessel with spiritual things so that you can be used by God. We have to refresh our life with the Bible, uh, with godly fellowship, with church. Hey, with soul winning. I mean, with soul winning. You know we're called to preach the gospel? Did you know the Great Commission still applies in 2023? Do you realize it is our job to open the Bible and open our mouth and let the Holy Spirit work through us and knock on somebody's door and tell them they're going to hell and out of love compel them to trust in Christ. That's our job. Amen. That's what we're here for. Yep. 2023, it's not popular. Next he says, look, he says, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve Him only. Serve Him only. Do you know this is your only real purpose in life? Right. Everything else follows this. We've been talking a lot about marriage and weddings and the house and family all this year, really. And boy, the year is going by fast. But it starts with God. And then the father answers to God. And then the wife answers to the father and to God. And then the children answer to the mom and dad and to God. And children that won't obey their parents, usually they have a problem with God. And as parents, we're there to represent God in a sense. And we're, we're supposed to show His righteous love and His compassion and His correction and His instruction. And we're supposed to train them up in doctrine. We're supposed to prepare them for service for the Lord. If your children grow up and, and they never get married and have a family, but they serve God, you can, you can go to the grave saying, I've succeeded, God has gotten the glory. That's true. Now, all the more if you say, hey, I prepared them to serve, I sanctified them, and they're serving God in marriage and in a family, then you say, hey, praise the Lord, I've succeeded. Your purpose in life is to worship the Lord God. It's to praise Him in your actions and in your words. This is why you're alive. Have you ever wondered why we're not raptured out the moment we believe? See, I, I believe that. I believe that. Boo, where'd he go? Oh, he must have really believed that one. We know he's gone. He's, boo, he's transported out of here. Look, his shoes are left. It doesn't work that way. God has a plan and a purpose for us on earth to serve him with the rest of our life, to give him ourself as a living sacrifice, a living, walking sacrifice. You know the problem. Uh, we want to tell jokes and, and look there's nothing wrong with jokes god has a sense of humor I, I brought up a joke in that last sermon we were talking about that evangelist that uh, used a joke inappropriately right and it, it wasn't for god's glory and 
shame, shame, you know? And, and we, we tell jokes. Brother Ross had a pretty good one before the service. I, Why don't you come on up and tell everybody? Uh-oh, uh, no, you didn't want to? Okay, all right, all right. Uh, then I won't include it in the sermon. If he doesn't think it's that good, then I won't tell it to y'all. Uh, but now, God wants us to laugh, and God wants us to have joy, and God wants us to encourage each other, and God wants us to point others to Christ. This is our purpose, is it not? This is why we're here. When we see that, and when we do it, there is no greater joy than being in the will of the, of the Lord as we serve other people. It's our only real... And, and you know, the priesthood of the believer. Think about this. We're reading about Samuel, a young man that from birth was set apart to serve the Lord. He's a priest, a prophet, and a judge. Well, you're a priest. If you're saved, raise your hand if you're saved. You're a priest, you're a priest, you're a priest, you're a priest of God. You're the priest of the Most High God. We don't go to some Catholic priest, some dude in a dress. No, no, no. We don't go to uh, Israel where they're going, they want to set something on fire. No, no, no. The priesthood is of the believer and we bring sacrifices to God and it comes out of our own lips and we bring people unto the Lord. We're here to keep the Word and teach the Word. That's our purpose, to serve Him. Now, you notice, go back to verse 3, 1 Samuel 7, verse 3. This verse is the pattern. This verse is the recipe. Uh, put away, right? Then prepare, he says, and prepare your hearts to, unto the Lord and serve Him only, and He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. If you would go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, uh, I'm trying to write Deuteronomy. Go to Deuteronomy 30. Well, that's right. I'm writing deliver. Okay. D-E-L-I-V-E-R. Uh, then the Lord... Well, I should get you... I should volunteer you. I should just throw the marker and have you fill it in for me. I you probably do better. Um, he will deliver you as much as you obey Him. God is merciful with us especially when we're obedient unto Him. That's right. God has a plan. It's that we would serve Him with our entire life. Our pattern. We listen to the preaching. We return unto Him because we're convicted by the preaching. We put away the things in our life that uh, the Lord is not pleased with. We put these things away. We prepare our hearts so that we can be used by God. We're refilling ourselves with righteous things. We're putting good things in our life so that then we can effectively serve Him long term. And then we know His promise is He will deliver us. He will protect us. He's going to take care of us. In 1 Peter 4, he says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Think about that. Judgment must begin at the house of God. God, this world is so messed up. Can't we just fix them? Well, I tell you what, if we all get together and we vote in these people, it'll cha we'll, we'll change Washington and then Washington can change. No, no, no. Starts with you. Starts with the church. Starts with the pulpit. It starts in the pew. If we're going to be effective, we have to work on ourselves individually. Yeah. Every sermon you hear, you could very easily yeah, kind of look at that person and nod them or think, oh, I know that, that, that person back there should be listening to this one. That's good for them. <laughs> we need to look at it for ourselves and say, okay, Lord, help me to judge me according to your standard so I can be used of you. You're in Deuteronomy 30. Look at verse number, uh, number 1. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. Now wait, Deuteronomy 30, he's kind of reminding them, I made you a promise, and if you do it, you're good to go. But when you don't do what I said, and when I kick you out, and I spread you around, and I punish you, then you bring it to your mind, and you remember that I still love you, even though you're wayward, and there's still a chance to come back to me. I'll help you. Look what he says. Call them to mind among the nations with the Lord thy God had driven thee. Verse 2, And shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey His voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children within all thine heart and all thy soul. He says, when you return unto God, do it wholeheartedly. Do it with all of your being. 
You know, I, I've heard of people before, you know, they, the preacher preached against rock and roll, and I went and threw out the ten worst ones I had. I kept a couple, but they're, they're, they're kind of a Christian band. Well, why don't you throw it all out? Why don't you start over? I mean, really, when it comes time to cleaning house, which room do you want to skip? Oh, well, I, I skipped the, the trash room. That, that one was filthy. We left that one. I, I skipped the bathroom. We just let it stink. No, clean house. Clean it all. Work on everything. Say, Lord, there's nothing in my house that's off limits. What do I need to change to please you? I want to return with all of my heart, all of my soul. Look at verse 3. Deuteronomy 30, verse 3. That then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity. He says, I'll turn this thing around. I'll bring you back. I'll protect you. I'll deliver you. He says, he will turn thy captivity and have compassion on thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. Uh, go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Again, we see that glimpse here of God's plan for restoration. Uh, God wants to deliver us from our troubles, but before he does that, he wants us to listen when the prophet speaks or listen to the word of God as it can speak to you individually. You don't have to call me up at six o'clock in the morning and say, Pastor Fannin, oh, tell me something good. I want to start my day right. I'll say, what? What are you doing calling me? I'll tell you something good. Uh, go to Proverbs 17. Today's the 17th and God's already got something good for you, right? Look, listen to what God has to say. Then he'll tell you, return unto me. And if you believe that, you'll begin to change things You'll clean house. You'll put away from the things that offend the Lord. You'll prepare your heart to be filled with the word of the Lord so you can be used by him. Then you will effectively be serving the Lord. You'll be successful at your spiritual purpose in life. And by then, you don't have to worry about the deliverance. You know it's going to happen. He's going to take care of you. He's going to give you what you need. Second Chronicles 7, you guys know this, verse 14, but I thought we should turn here anyway. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we see a very similar pattern. It's almost identical. Uh, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. There we go. Humble, pray, seek, and turn from their wicked ways. If you really want God's attention, you don't come to God demanding anything. You come humbly. Oh, God, forgive me. I'm nothing. A contrite spirit, right? That's the sacrifice he looks for. Humble yourself. Pray. Seek. Fast. Turn from your wicked ways. Look for sin in your life you can turn from for God's glory. He says, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. Did you notice that forgiveness has to come before healing? Before God can really fire you up and use you, He wants to forgive your sin. But He's waiting for you to turn from your sin. Thank God you don't have to stop your sin to be saved. You have to trust in Christ. You have to stop trusting in yourself and stop trusting in your religion or your baptism or your good works. No, no. But once you are saved, you ought to repent of your sin every day. You ought to search yourself every day and say, Lord, help me to get closer to you and know where I'm lazy and know where I struggle. If it's in my mind, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, give me the power over my mind. Lord, if it's in my flesh, give me the power over my flesh. Help me to be used of you. Lord, if it's in my house and there's things that I allow that I just don't put my foot down and I just won't say no and I'm acquiescing to the devil's power in my house, then Lord, give me the strength and the boldness and the fire to turn from my wickedness. Why? because he's ready to forgive. Yep. He wants to forgive. He will hear and forgive. And then he says, and then I'll heal. We all need some healing in life in certain areas. But there's a process to get there. Go back to 1 Samuel 7. Go back to 1 Samuel 7. Again, look at verse number 3. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve Him only, and He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth, 
and serve the Lord only. This is great. There's other places. They tried to do both. They tried to mix a little bit of Baal and a little bit of Jehovah, and it didn't really work so well. Here they got it right. Verse 5, And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. Now isn't this interesting? He says, Hey guys, let's have church. It's called a congregation. We come together to hear the preaching and the praying. We're working together for a purpose, right? We're going to pray for each other. They desire God's blessing. And you know what God gave them? Judgment from the preaching. Look at verse 6. And they gathered together unto Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord. This is what's called a poor offering. I won't go deep into that. It's like we have something and we're just giving it to the Lord. We're trusting Him. Uh, and fasted on that day. They withheld themselves uh, from physical relationships. They probably withheld themselves from food, maybe water, hey, maybe even coffee. If they were some real strict Baptists, you know. Uh, depends, right? And fasted on that day and said there, Here's their confession to the Lord. We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. They got together and had church. The people prepared themselves. They poured out themselves. They sacrificed themselves. And then he judged them. They, they desired God's blessing in His presence. And he judged them. Now what's interesting, when you congregate and you pray and you fast and you pour out yourself, you confess your sins, you become vulnerable you become vulnerable. Isn't that what happens when you really have a heart-to-heart -heart with somebody? And they pour out their heart and they tell you what they're worried about. They tell you what they're concerned about. They tell you their weakness. Now, as a loving brother or sister in Christ, you say, hey, I love you and I forgive you or I'm praying for you or hey, I have a solution for you. I have a verse for you. Right? The weak, fleshly one would be like, oh, now I know how to push their buttons. You know, Now I really know how to get them. Well, that's not what God's will is. Samuel judged them. In the flesh today, most people just simply don't want to be judged. They don't want to be judged. But God wants everyone to be judged. If we would be spiritual, we would say, Oh, Lord, judge us! I'll tell you what to do. Maybe you guys can help me out. Sometimes coming up with topics for a sermon is like a roller coaster. If you will go to the Lord and say, Lord, give Pastor Fannin a sermon that I need to hear so you can use me and then heal me and put me in the ministry or answer that prayer, whatever. Lord, give him a sermon I need to hear. That, right? Man, whoa. That's kind of a scary request, isn't it? Now, when it happens, don't get mad at me. But be thankful to the Lord for judgment. Samuel judged here. They were vulnerable as they're confessing their sins to the Lord. If you read your daily proverb in, first, uh, in Proverbs 17, 15, it says, He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. You know, we don't have very much righteous judgment going on in our government today. Everything is misjudged. Everybody's judging what's wrong. They're doing it incorrectly. And I believe America needs biblical judgment. And Christians don't even want to hear it. They want to have some, some wannabe church, uh, some, something that doesn't even look like church at all. What they do, they may have the name Jesus somewhere. They may have a Bible verse somewhere. They may have some scriptures in some of their songs, but it's so far from church. It's fake churches. You might as well just have a sign. No Bible allowed. Judgment-free zone. We don't want anybody's feelings to get hurt. Well, as Christians, we ought to desire judgment. My prayer to God is that He would judge me and show me my sin so I can be used of Him. So that, so that I can be more successful at helping you be a, a successful Christian. Look at verse 7. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. So everybody's in church. They're gathered together. They're vulnerable. Here comes the enemy to attack. Here comes that physical attack because there's spiritual growth happening, right? They went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said unto Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that He will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. The people say, oh, please keep praying to God. We need some help. We're doomed. We really need some help. Cease not to pray. We're going to look at another place in a minute where Samuel uses that same phrase about not ceasing to pray. But let's read a couple more verses first. Look at verse 9. He says, And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord, 
And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. These are probably like the four best words in the whole Bible. The Lord heard him. When you follow this pattern for revival, when you follow this recipe for restoration spiritually and spiritual growth, the Lord will hear, he will hear you. And the Lord will hear you. You say, I've got something I need, and I need an answer from the Lord. What do I need to do? Well, I tell you what to do. Uh, get in His Word. Hear what He said. Return your heart unto Him, all of your heart. Put away everything that offends Him. And I mean everything. Unsubscribe, delete, throw it away, trash it, junk it. Then prepare your heart. Refill yourself with the Word of God. Get it in your mind. Uh, make plans to serve Him for the rest of your life. And then your, then your prayer will be answered clear. Very clear. And the Lord heard you. When you get right, He'll hear you. If you're rebellious, don't expect God to hear you. Don't expect God to do it on your own terms. God, I need an answer. And not only do I need an answer, I need the answer to be X, Y, and Z. You know? <laughs> or, I know I'm in sin, but I still need your deliverance over here. I, you, you need to come over here and give me what I want, or take care of this problem, or eliminate this debt, or whatever. But I'm going to keep my sin. He doesn't want that. He wants your heart. And it's evidenced by your actions. And when He sees your cry, and He sees your change, and He sees what you put away, and He sees what, he put, what you put back in your heart, and then he really hears you and he's on your side. Look at verse 10, he says, And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to the battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. Now, this is really fascinating. It tells us the Lord is using thunder as a weapon. Did you know that thunder can be a weapon? Well, Brother Eric, just early, man, he says, boy, the clouds rolled in, it went dark, thunder, lightning, hail, we couldn't go anywhere, flood came out of nowhere, we're stuck, I mean, just like that. Now, when God really wants to thunder, he can. Uh, go ahead to uh, chapter 12, you're in 1 Samuel 7, I want you to see this. Uh, think about thunder as a weapon. Do you understand in the end times when God begins to pour out his wrath? He starts with thunder. Thunder, hail, lightning, fire mingle with blood. You know when he wraps up that inside the seventh seal is all of the judgment vials of God. He pours out the vials and uh, all, all of the judgments of God in the wrath of God that last three and a half years. The final judgment is called the seven thunders. And he says, seal up the book right now. He said, don't tell them what the seven thunders uttered. And it's like, so the beginning of wrath is called thunder. At the end of the wrath, it's called thunder. So that's like God's sign of judgment. He's bringing something down out of heaven upon the earth as a form of judgment. Uh, God uses that as a sign. You're in 1 Samuel 12. Um, let's see, look at verse number, verse number 14, first of all. If ye will fear the Lord God and serve Him, and obey His voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then, here's that if-then statement that comes with covenants, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your father. So he lays this out. This is when they get a king. We'll see it in a few weeks. If you do it right, then I will bless you. If you rebel against me and don't obey me, I'm going to judge you like before. Look at verse 18. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Can you imagine if we had a big issue we were all coming together praying about, and we're on our knees and we're crying and we're praying and we're asking for the Lord's blessing, and then I step outside and I call into the name of the Lord. And then all of a sudden, everybody go, whoa, Pastor Fan has got a direct line. We don't step on his toes or something, right? I mean, that's kind of what happened with Samuel. God used thunder as a sign, as a symbol of his power, of, that he has the power to destroy. And yet he doesn't destroy his children. Why? Because he loves us. Look at verse 20. 1 Samuel 12, verse 20. And Samuel said unto the people, fear not. Ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside 
For then should you go after the vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. That's the vanities and the temptations of this world. Look out for it, right? Verse 22, For the Lord will not forsake His people for His great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you His people. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. He says, it's a sin if I stop praying for you guys. That's a heavy burden. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things He hath done for you. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. Wow! <laughs> what, a, what a statement, what a thought. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 7. We'll finish up. Uh, God can use thunder as a judgment. In Psalm 18, it tells the story. It says, The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave His voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, He sent out His arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. That's what's happening here. Uh, it wasn't just thunder. God is sending fire, hail, arrows. He's sending missiles out of heaven to attack the Philistines that dare, that would come against the church that was sitting and you know, praying, crying out to the Lord, fasting, putting away the idols, preparing to serve. And he said, the Philistines, aha, they're vulnerable. Let's go get them now. God protected. Verse 11. 1 Samuel 7, verse 11, And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came under Bethkar. Now when you see God do an amazing work, when you see God give you an amazing supernatural victory, when God blesses you, then it's time to get up and to go to war for Him. It's time for you to realize the Lord is with us. He's on our side. He's doing the impossible. Now I'm going to pursue after this vision that He's given me. What is it? The gates of hell shall not prevail. What do we have to be afraid of if the Lord is with us? Let's get up and go. That ought to be our attitude when it comes to saving souls. He's told us to do it. He's shown us how. It's easier than you think. Those that are new at preaching the Gospel, it's usually the low-hanging fruit that He sends you. God, would to God, all the Lord's people were prophets. Everyone under the sound of my voice should be a preacher, should preach the gospel. What good is a preacher in a church that won't go out and preach the gospel to the lost? What good is a person in the pew that won't go out and preach the gospel to the lost? We're called by His name. He's given us spiritual victories. He's taking care of the supernatural. All we have to do is show up and do the simple things. And we do it by faith. That's God's will. Look at verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Now this is interesting. The definition is in the sentence. It's a stone, Eben. Ezer means help. And maybe I got it backwards. I don't speak Hebrew. But I, I think I had it the right way. Ebenezer. It's a stone of help. Why did they set up a stone? It was a symbol to remind us that God helped us at this particular time. What is Ebenezer? It's a stone of help. It's representing that Christ is our deliverer. Now, we sing that song, Come Thou Fount. And it talks about, he says, Here I raise mine Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I am come. That's a symbol. We're talking about God's victory that He provides. Ebenezer is the stone of help from God as He delivered by thunder in this situation. Um, it's also, Ebenezer is mentioned three times in the Bible, by the way. We see it here in chapter 7. It's mentioned in chapter 4 when they bring the ark to Ebenezer. It's mentioned in chapter 5 when the Philistines take the ark from Ebenezer. And it's mentioned here that in this place they put up a stone and said this is the stone of help where the Lord has restored us and restored His blessing on us. Now look at verse 13. So the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more into the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel, which were restored to Israel, from Ekron even unto Gath, 
in the coasts thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines, and there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Now this is cool. Samuel was successful as a leader so much so that as long as he was alive, everything was well. When Samuel passes, war begins to plague the king and his kingdom because of his sin. We'll see that in the near future, but look at verse 15. We're almost done. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. It's interesting. How was it that Samuel stayed away the curse of the Lord by judgment? By saying what God has said. By reminding us that we need to return to the Lord. Verse 16. He went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah and judged Israel in all those places. He was a circuit judge. This is a common term. This is the history of America. He's a circuit riding preacher like an evangelist that would go around from place to place to place and remind people what God said. He told them. They said, oh, pray for us. And he said, I will teach you the Bible. There's a shortage of men in this time that could open the Bible, that could stand up and teach God's way and do it the right way. And that shortage is back in America. There's churches everywhere. I mean, if I could really throw a football, I could stand here and throw, there's one over there, there's one over there, there's one over there. I mean, we could throw, foot. there's one right there. You know what I mean? I could throw a football and hit a couple churches if I had a good arm on me, right? I get Brother Doug, he he get out his pistol, we could hit five or ten, right? Uh, think about it. Churches are everywhere. They're so prevalent in America, and yet most of them preach this false gospel. It's wicked. They've got people in bondage. They're confused. They don't know that salvation is by faith alone. They still feel like they have to work their way to heaven. We need judgment in America. Verse 17. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. Samuel was a prophet, a priest, and a judge. He taught the word of the Lord. He told prophecies that would come to place. And he also judged some very basic things. There was a shortage of men that were prepared to teach the Bible and judge the people. And men, prepare to judge. The world doesn't like the word judge. How many of you have had somebody say, well, I used to go to that church, but those uh, I don't want to be judged. Here, how many of you heard somebody complain about a church because of judgment? Oh, yeah very common and listen we shouldn't judge ourselves amongst ourselves and we shouldn't be little people and try to oh put them down or try to put us up or oh they're not quite like us we shouldn't do that but we need to know what the bible says and we need to do what it says judgment must begin at the house of god he's talking about cleaning house spiritually did you know that god is judgment and he loves judgment psalm 33 he loveth righteousness and judgment psalm 37 for the lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints, they are preserved forever. But the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. Isaiah 61, For I, the Lord, love judgment. Now if God loves judgment, do you love God's judgment in your life? Are you seeking for God to judge you, your heart, your thoughts, so that your priorities please Him? It's time for us to clean house. He's given us a pattern in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3. Hear what he says, return unto him, put away your idols, prepare your heart, reset things, serve him for the rest of your life, and then God will hear your prayer, and he'll deliver us. That's my prayer for you, it's my prayer for me. I ask that God would use this church, by, but he can't until we first will clean our own house, and then we can help others. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take this pattern to heart. I pray that you would help us to be encouraged by these verses. I pray that it would motivate us to be stronger spiritually. Lord, I ask that you would help us to be a blessing to others. I ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit so we can love others and preach the gospel. Lord, please show us the things in our life that are holding us back. Then, Lord, give us the strength to do what you would have us to do. Lord, I ask that you would bless this wedding this weekend and that you get all the glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>